And Vicky, do you want to say a few words of introduction about the, the display? Yes, I thought I'd start off by um, telling you why I wanted to go to Orkney. Um, because although I've painted a lot of landscape over the years, Orkney, as you will all know, is a very, very different place. Um, one of the things that's always inspired me is a book by a poet and a writer and an art historian called Peter Davidson. It's called The Idea of North, and it deals with not only some of the art produced concerning the North, but the writing, the legends, and the kind of psyche of the whole drama of the Northern Lands. And he writes very beautifully about the white nights of, of summer and the extraordinary feeling that that perpetual twilight round about June, July leaves so that the landscape, if you can imagine it, very, very quiet because all the animals and birds and things are asleep. You can still see it reasonably clearly, but it's almost like a pointillist painting that it's just not quite in focus. That's how I found it when I went there. So that inspired me very much. And then the other thing that I've long remembered as a fantastic exhibition that the National Galleries put on, one festival, I think it was 2012, and it was symbolist painting, Northern European landscape painting. And it was sort of subtitled or perhaps surtitled Van Gogh to Kandinsky. Mm -hmm. But the things that really struck me were the landscape paintings of Nolder and of um, Hold, Holder and Van, Van, no, 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 somebody else, anyway. But it was, it was these other sort of Scandinavian landscape painters that I found so um, meaningful. They changed the landscape into something mm. that was unreal. <clears throat> they altered the sort of picture plane of instead of looking at a landscape that, and doing that, mm -hmm. they brought the whole thing together so that there was this extraordinary unreality. And that's, that's what I thought when I saw the, the request form for the residences that Orkney would be a fantastic place to visit because in my own work, I've been moving much more towards the atmosphere of a landscape and in Orkney, I felt I would be presented with the sea, the sky, the land at the bottom, very elemental things. And to have a chance to look at the white nights of the northern summer that Peter Davidson talks about, and the deep darkness of the winter, I thought would make an interesting um, opposition, if you like. Two different views of the same place. Great. Well, Vicky, thank you very much. And first of all, congratulations on the exhibition, which looks marvellous, and also on a, what seems to be a very successful residency. Mm. Could we maybe start by just situating folk in the exhibition a little bit? Because you, were, you went twice for the residency, yeah. once in the summer mm -hmm. and once in the winter. Mm -hmm. That's right. Summer, winter. Yes. Talk, yes. talk us around uh, a yeah. little bit. Summer, winter on these, these end walls. Um, I spent longer in the summer and stayed at Bursay, which is on the west coast of mainland. So there's nothing really between Bursay and, I suppose, Newfoundland. You know, you're looking right out. Uh, I had a chance to see the lovely collection at the pier. But staying on the coast was a wonderful experience. And I started off... I decided that I wanted to try and begin work straight, straight away rather than thinking, should I do this or would I try that? Should I look at this first? So I just sort of went in drawing the landscape around Bursay, which is that big long um, painting in the middle there where you see the waves come crashing in and the farmsteads and the villages. And that occurs in a lot of the paintings because it changes over time. And it was a very, very dramatic visually and then on the summer ones I was looking I was waiting for this kind of magical moment when the when the solstice light would let me look out of the window at midnight or one o'clock in the morning and I'd still be able to see the sun 
and for the first three days, it was heavy, heavy cloud. So a lot of these silvery ones are me desperately waiting for when I was going to see the magic of the sun go down. Um, and the one at the, in the middle at the bottom there shows the Brock of Bursay, which is this island that you can cross by a causeway to it. And was almost there like a sort of sleeping presence, sleeping animal, um, with the sun just beginning to go down. And that's really what fueled lots and lots of these paintings. And then there was Yesnaby, which I didn't know before I went there that I was going to draw so much. But I just find it absolutely incredible, that ancient structure, this, this, these amazing shelves which contained lots of fossils. So it was all the time speaking about a past landscape and what it contained. And then the power, of course, of the sea and the light. Mm. And the nighttime ones were very much at this stage of the... What's here is just what was done on the residency. So the nighttime ones were the things I did in November. And they've gone on to lead on to other things. But it was really the, the, the full moon lighting up this incredibly, incredible darkness. And that's what I concentrated on then. So you'd been to Orkney just once before. You mm. said you'd given a lecture. Yeah. But here you were in this completely new experience, completely new landscape. Tell us about your very first reactions. You, you, you fly into that wonderful, compact little airport uh, and your, your first forays into the landscape. What did you think? What have I done? What's this going to be like? Yeah, <laughs> something like that. It was so gentle and so soft, the land, as you come in. And when I, went, when I reached Bursay, I was thinking, yes, this is absolutely what I hoped it would be like because everything was on this horizontal plane. And normally, that's quite unusual for my landscapes. I usually compose them vertically, often with things like trees or, or buildings or bits of landscape in front of the space. Here, there was nothing. It was just line, line, line. And it was so complicated. And also, I found the way the sky, the luminosity of the sky, was something that I had to think very carefully about how I would try and approach that. And I found that with oil, it was very hard. The initial stages, I would have to really work away at, a, at something mm -hmm. that was in oil. It had to be layered, and it would take a long time. So a lot of these things were uh, watercolour ink or acrylic, just something that would try and get that incredible and that moving I mean it never stayed still it was quite extraordinary um, so you've got these focus points like the bit of land and then you've got this drama unfolding all mm. the time mm -hmm. the painting in the centre of that wall was, you said was one of the first things you, uh, mm. you, you uh, tackled mm. which is you know, it's a big mm. ambitious piece mm. I'm interested in how you manage your time in a residency because you've got really just a few weeks. Uh, you want to explore, you want to experiment, mm. yet you also have to focus your mm. time. How, how do you set about that? Mm. It must be um, quite demanding. Well, one thing that kind of helped me was that I'd injured my ankle before I went. So <laughs> when I got to Bursay, I was kind of hobbling. And I knew that I wasn't going to, I couldn't drive the car. I couldn't really walk around the headlands. So that added to that focus. And... <laughs> And in a way, that's always helped. I mean, after lockdown, for instance, I produced a whole lot of paintings that were simply about looking again at the land because you couldn't go anywhere else, but you were seeing them with a new, quite intense sort of vision. So I think that, that helped with the Orkney things. And so you were working, you were working outdoors, mm. and even for a larger piece like this would be back in the... Yeah, there was, there was a studio at Lynx House and there was um, a sort of little elevated room that you can, could draw from. Some of the very first drawings of the Bursay headland were from there. Um, and this one I started from a sort of 
pencil drawing, very accurate pencil drawing I'd made. And it's on Wenju paper, which is a, um, a Japanese paper that is incredibly strong, very, very thin. And I mean, in a way, it's a, it's a mad bit of paper to use for something that size, but you can, you can roll it all up. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I had to hang it out on the washing line at Bursay to dry <laughs> because it was drenched with color and ink. And it actually did wonderful things to the way the, the, the ink stayed on the surface. And it seemed to almost speak of the structure of the mm -hmm. land and that mm -hmm. in something that's enduring, yeah. fragile, and yet opening out and, and completely there. You mentioned that Wenzu paper. Yeah. You mentioned I have to go and look it up. Uh -huh. So it's rice paper. N you, it's mulberry. Mulberry usually used for calligraphy. So as you yes. say, you could roll it up. That's right, and but it comes. It has a texture. It comes in long yeah. rolls, and you can yeah. see the length through it. Right. There's there's like a kind of strengthening line. Okay. The ones on either side are rice paper. The smaller Yesnabi paintings, right. and that's much more difficult, I found, to, to, to lay down. It didn't have the same strength, and so it started to float about and fragment, which again was really interesting, okay. because it was like that broken surface. The other thing I established about Wenzu paper is that the suppliers will only deliver to mainland Britain. So if you want to use it in Orkney, you've got to go and fetch it there Absolutely. from, the, from you, yourself. Yeah. Um, and it was, notice in both the Yesnabi and these, uh, some of the sketches, you are playing with our sense of scale, aren't you? It's, it's not, we not, we're not sure whether, is it massive or is it tiny? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that deliberate mm -hmm. uh, playing with uh, scale without an obvious human reference. Yes. Some, something you associate with quite a lot of the northern artists that you mentioned yes. as well. Yes, that's right. There's often an absence, isn't there, of, of house or figure for scale. And so that, I think that's where you, the kind of imagination and memory starts to work. And the drawing for that big one in the middle was in a uh, sketchbook about that sort of size. It's one mm -hmm. of these in the, in the cabinet. Um, and so it was almost like looking at the whole thing and then taking it in, <laughs> mm. in your head, in, your, in, in the kind of ideas you have about it, setting it down and then letting it expand mm. again. Mm. And that, of course, is what happened with the, with the nighttime pictures too. Mm. Seeing this vast, beautiful, illuminated sky, but then thinking, I've got to somehow, I've got to control it. I've got yeah. to see what's yeah. happening. Yeah. Mm. Uh, interesting. The, that perhaps takes us a little bit into the particular landscape of Orkney, which, of course, everyone associates as being an ancient landscape, mm -hmm. a sense of timelessness, mm -hmm. but also one scarred, perhaps, by modernity and mm. especially two world wars mm. and so but it seems to have been the elemental and the that timelessness that appealed to you i know suddenly very few hints of uh, even human occupation maybe a hut here or mm -hmm. one wartime bunker mm -hmm. there but mm -hmm. otherwise it was that s horizontal sky the mm. rocks the, that sense of time that seems mm. to appeal to you yes um i mean the the ancient sites are absolutely incredible. But it's, I always almost felt it was sort of sacrilegious to paint them somehow. Um, but to walk around them and to visit them was, was like seeing, especially around Brodga and Stennes, and it was like the whole of, you can imagine somebody's, the whole of their idea of their world was there. The lock was salt water on one side, fresh water on the other. Mm -hmm. You could see the mountains of Hoy coming down like this, and that's where the sun went down in a natural cliff, cleft between the mountains. Yeah. So it's a magical place. I, don't, I mean, one day that will probably come out in the paintings, but um, kind of not yet. Mm. Um, yeah, I still haven't quite formulated how to get that mysterious thing happening without it becoming topographical. Yeah, you do confront a stone head-on, literally, in uh -huh. the piece to your right. Yeah. But I noticed in your, in your notes, uh, in some of the sketchbooks, you talk about uh, avoiding cliché, mm. avoiding topography, mm. uh, and pinning it down to just 
recording and looking for something deeper. Do you want mm. to say something about the challenge of that, of avoiding that mere recording of what you're seeing? Yes. Um, interestingly, it, it <laughs> relates to a lot of the paintings about Venice as well. I mean, that's a place <laughs> that's been painted to, to death, really. Uh, and all the time in the work there, it was trying to avoid some sort of cliché, some sort of idea of the Venetian beauty mm, and the mm. sun and this and that and the next. And the same with being in Orkney, it was, it was just trying to avoid the sort of theatre of tourism. Um, I mean, there was a world of difference between seeing the sights in summer when there were lots of tourists around and seeing them in the winter when there was hardly anybody there, and seeing them on a, on a, on a sort of midsummer's uh, mm -hmm. night when the light was going out of the sky, they became magical, wonderful places. Um, and there was no room for a selfie, you know. There, there was something completely different about it. Mm -hmm. And you touched on this uh, in, in the very beginning, but uh, you're an artist that we associate, I suppose, with landscapes that you've spent a huge amount of time in, that, um, that you know really well mm. over many years, mm. your, around mm. your homes in the Pentland Hills and yeah. so on. What was it like, the experience, in a sense, of flying in somewhere, doing some work, and then flying out again? That must be quite different. Yes, it is, and I think that's why I wanted to make this exhibition about what happened there. I wanted to try and share that sense of um, pressure, time pressure, excitement, some anxiety. Um, how do I gather this? How do I respond to it? And in a way, I'd, quite, I'd almost like this to always be together. I mean, I don't think pra in practical terms it will ever always be together. But in, in a kind of ideal thing, I will think of this as a body of work which represented that seeking and searching and floundering about and, you know, that sort of deep excitement and sort of mystical things that, ha that it seemed to suggest to me. Um, and so the paintings that are de developing from this are almost like a, a different kind of activity. I'm always almost having to put a, um, an objective twist onto what I'm, what I'm doing rather than letting everything flood in. I'm actually having to say, now, come on, you know, you've got to, make a, you've got to make a big painting like this about it, and it's got to have this, that, and the next thing. Whereas this had a life of itself and a kind of rhythm of itself. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can see that, but there's, there's, there's also a strong continuity with uh, your work as a whole, isn't there? Mm. Um, there's a, a sense of experience rather than uh, recording, that uh, it's about bringing out perhaps your, your emotional reaction mm. to what you're seeing rather than simply mm. recording. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you can't help but be struck by just how different it is. I was going to ask the tree question, for example. Oh, the tree question. I, if, if, we were going to, if we were going to send Victoria Crow to a landscape which was so different, where would we think of, oh, an almost treeless uh, island? Well, that's what I thought would be really good, actually. Yeah. I thought that would be a, a very positive thing. Um, and that's why residences are, are good. I mean, Nick mentioned in the introduction that they are for all ages, but I was surprised to get it. I thought somebody of my age wouldn't stand a chance of getting a residency. But in fact, it's very important for middle artists, older artists, people that have had a lot of experience to have that chance of escaping from the pressures of studio or exhibiting or whatever it is, to have a, a time apart mm. in which to find themselves, find new things. So let's talk a little bit more about light. Mm. And of course, uh, I was being a little bit facetious when I said you associate you with trees. Mm. Of course, it's light, light behind the trees. Trees spreading across, so that you see the sort of negative, positive uh, mm. shapes. Um, tell us a little bit more about the experience of those long nights. I mean, I saw some of the drawings you done were at two o'clock in the morning, between mm. midnight and two o'clock. Mm. Describe the, mm. the, the the experience of the light mm. at that time in 
on Orkney. Mm. Well, I was very excited because once the clouds had gone, <laughs> about three days in, they were, we had incredible sort of sunsets. We had those lenticular clouds. Yes. I became very, very excited about the cloud formation. Um, and there's a wonderful thing on Hoy. It's the Hoy weather station. And there's a guy there called Jeff Clark who set up a meteorological outpost on Rackwick and was allowed to do it. And he started the Cloud Appreciation Society. <laughs> and I thought, this is just fantastic. And the names are so poetic. So anyway, I'd seen my lenticular clouds. Um, and at, at night, when, when the light was going down, you could still see the, the brock. You could still see the grasses going up to it. You could still see the sort of outlines of bits of the village. You could see the sky, the sea behind it. And the light became, well, it was quite a pinky light after the sun had gone down the afterglow. And it was also like a light that was uh, strangely moving. That's why I mentioned Sura before. And that, those kind of pointillist paintings where the substance and the form is there, but it's shifting or vibrating ever so slightly. Um, and then I'd be looking at this, and then the, the, the pink would disappear. But you could still see everything, but it was a kind of pale, a sort of colder light that came in. And you realize that was the next day. <laughs> and it, it, was as, it was as magical, the, transact, you know, the, tra the difference between those two states mm -hmm. was kind of minimal. And are you watching uh, or are you watching and trying to paint at mm. the same time and how, how do you paint in half light it's very difficult <laughs> <laughs> there's um some those i think it's that it's that one isn't it that all the, those landscapes in the sketchbook yeah. those are all just kind of painted very 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 quickly and i've also tried to do things like draw the sun draw the clouds on the sunset just with a line pen which is kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's almost impossible to do, but it's one, one way of holding onto an image. Mm -hmm. And I've always had quite a good retentive color and tonal image in my mind. I'm able to hold that quite well. It's the structures that I sometimes find hard. So those things in a way were fairly straightforward. <coughs> it had like sort of three bands and that was mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. to play around with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that wonderful sense of spontaneity. But those were obviously uh, on the spot. Did you come back and do others from memory, or? No, um, no. All of these were done from the references in the sketchbooks, and the Caesar Studio at Bursay was yeah. there in the landscape too. Right. Yes. Gosh. So you could make notes about what was happening. And you say everything's changing. Mm. Was the weather frustrating? It was at the beginning, yes, um, when I was desperate to see the white night. <laughs> but at the same time, it was wonderful because you had this sort of animated thing that was constantly changing and it didn't have any form. Mm. You know, the cloud, I mean, the cloud does have form, but it was amorphous. And that was a, a big challenge, how mm. to work around that. And I haven't got that sussed properly yet. Ooh. Don't know. <laughs> Uh, we talked about playing with um, ambiguity as a skill. I notice also that in a number of the paintings, there's an ambiguity about where the sky ends and the mm. sea begins. Mm. And I was thinking about, you mentioned northern artists. Mm. I was thinking of paintings, by example, for example, by the Norwegian artist Munch, mm -hmm. where exactly the same thing is a particular light, mm -hmm. half light. Mm and the sky merges mm. into the, uh, the sea. Mm. Um, am I on a completely the wrong track? No, no, no. That's, I was getting quite mesmerised when, when you were saying <laughs> that. <I> was, oh. <laughs> no, um, and I, start, I write a lot of things down as well, and that's perhaps something that I'll do, and I never, didn't have time to do it with this exhibition, but things like in the sketchbooks and notebooks, there's things like... Last night there was a silver line on the horizon, and so that's a sort of memory mm. thing. And what you said about the monk things, there's one inch of pale 
um, Naples yellow above the sky. You know, things like that mm -hmm. I've written down. And it, it is that, um, it's kind of almost like a, a string of consciousness in a sort of poetic sense that has under, underlined a lot of these. And it's been as valuable to me as some of the source material drawings. Mm. Well, thank you for being, uh, for writing in a legible way, even <laughs> though you're doing it in the, the half light. Um, let's just, could you just say a little bit more about the importance of sketchbooks? Um, mm. Because, and here's a, we're not going to start situating people in time, but uh, uh, when you were a very young uh, tutor at the art college, I was a young student at the art college, mm -hmm. and one of the things that you banged on about was <laughs> the importance of sketchbooks, drawing every day, drawing all the time. Did I do Use that? Your, oh. You did. Yes. <laughs> So, can you say a little bit more? Because the sketchbooks, um, they're, they're, they're notes, they're private, they're for you, but yet you don't mind showing them as a, a work in progress either, do you? Well, not if they're in a glass case. I mean, if there was a fire tonight, those would be what I'd go for. Yeah. Not the paintings, it'd be the sketchbooks. Okay. They're the real... I, I've checked, there isn't going to be a there fire isn't. tonight. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, one of the very... Well, one exhibition that I saw in Amsterdam at the Van Gogh Museum <laughs> was upstairs, and that's never left me. It was all the Vincent letters laid out to his, his brother with the little tiny sketches of fantastically beautiful mm. little drawings of the compositions of paintings that he would be doing. And to, to me, that was like entering into his mind, having a really deep conversation with, with what his art was about. Mm -hmm. And in a way, yes, I banged on about it in the early days, but it's something I've always uh, thought very, very important because it's incredibly meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in meaningful to people that come after us to see mm -hmm. what we really are thinking about. Yeah. We may don't write it down as a kind of, as a, as a sort of treatise on, on um, you know, as a sort of concept. It's, it's all there in the working books. Well, I think that's, and I hope people will agree with me, but that's one of the great pleasures of this uh, exhibition is that you feel as if we are looking over your shoulder a little mm. bit. We can sense the emergence of ideas as they flow through and ricochet across uh, different pieces of work. So I think, you know, thank you for allowing us to, uh, to, to, to see that, as well as pieces that you've uh, pushed a little bit further. Um, a little bit more on the choice of materials, and sorry if that's a little bit of an obsession of mine, but um, the range of materials that you've used is quite striking. There's oil, there's acrylic, there's mixed media, there's works where you've primed with pumice. pumice. What's that about? Pumice. Um, pity, it's pity I can't take that one out the frame. There's a couple on pumice. It, it's pumice powder, yeah. which is completely inert and you mix it with your primer, and it gives um, a very absorbent, but also slightly textured, irregularly textured, it's not like sandpaper, mm -hmm. ground. And watercolor and ink just, well, they, they work almost like lichen on a stone. Mm. They move in and out of these little tiny mm. gradations of texture, mm -hmm. and it's a lovely thing to work on. And it's also part of my search for not being topographical, mm -hmm. you know, making it a bit difficult to, to, to get a paint mark or a, yeah. or, or a line down. It does, does a different yeah. thing to what it would do if on a very, very fine right. piece of paper. Yeah. And I imagine that was something, is this Ring of Brodka or the Stones of Stennis here on the it's right? It's Brodka. Brodka. Yes. Maybe that, uh, that volcanic powder uh, helps you to get exactly. a sense, sense of the ancient texture. Exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, yes, works, it's a real, really well. real parallel, yeah. yeah. Now, you said something in your notes, and apologies if I paraphrase it, but you said something about um, that uh, you're not uh, working on Orkney, you weren't able to control the outcome in a rational way. Mm. And of course, you're an artist that will associate however deep it goes and however, uh, whatever mysteries you explore, you're in supreme control of what you're doing. Mm. Uh, and yet here you are talking about, I can't control the outcome. Was that, was that disturbing or refreshing? Um, 
I'm just thinking of a print I'm just doing, and somebody's come and shown me the proof of the print, and I can't control it, and so that's distressed me today. Um, I do like to be in control of it, but I think you have to control when... I mean, like the paper flaking away, that seemed a rational point to mm. me to make yes. because of the subject matter. I wouldn't have done it with the, with the moon and things like that. So it seems like a kind of um, a parallel way of trying to explain the thing I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so water and sky and clouds, let it happen, let it happen. So perhaps part of the liberating experience of a residency is... Mm. Uh, it's different. You're yeah. going to have to um, yeah. let go a bit, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, in perhaps the, 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 the last phase of my questions, I want to just ex explore a little bit more about which artists or poets were on your mind uh, mm. while you were working in Orkney, because you know, obviously Orkney has quite a rich artistic tradition mm. of its own. Mm. Sylvia Wishart is a great mm. artist. It'd be remiss of me not to mention Stanley Custer as a former director of the National Gallery, of course. <laughs> um, but you mentioned in some notes you were thinking about Winifred Nicholson, who had visited mm -hmm. Orkney. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about that. Well, there's, a, there's a whole range of connections. That's the other odd thing about Orkney as well. You find you meeting people that knew somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody. And the same thing with um, at the Pier Art Centre and that wonderful collection of St. Ives artists. Mm. Um, and I'm half Cornish, so that's a really kind of close uh, mm. tie for me, mm -hmm. all of that work. I've got great sympathy for it. Um, but Winifred Nicholson I was particularly interested in because I painted Kathleen Rain for the Portrait Gallery in London, and behind her was a mirror that Winifred Nicholson had given her. They were great friends. And in that mirror, some of Kathleen's younger self and some of her poetry is reflected. And so I was interested to think, and Kathleen Rain had always talked about Edwin Muir, mm. the poet, the um, Orcadian poet, and he, he taught George Mackay Brown in New Battle. Um, <laughs> And so there, there were all these kind of links, and I was very pleased to see that I could link what I'd thought about Kathleen and her work, which I like very much. It's kind of, she's a mystic kind of poet. And to link that with Orkney and this kind of undertow of, of the mystic and the profound was, can I just read? There's a little tiny Please. bit I wanted to tell you about, which was um, a quote from some of the George Mackay Brown things, some of his phrases, I thought were just so beautiful. He talks about a, a beach that shineth in blackness. He talks in the, in the main, Western mainland about a stillness into which the torrents of history are gathered. In the silence, an image of the past stirs and illuminates our presence. And then he talks about the Orkney imagination is haunted by time. It's one of Edwin Muir's great things, themes. And an Edwin Muir quote, yet still from Eden springs the root as clear as on the starting day. And that again links with Kathleen Rain. And I find these things incredibly moving and, and almost in a way they take me to the resolution of the painting because I then have that in the back of mm. my mind, mm. this sense of the timelessness. They've unearthed it and sort of given it to me in a sentence. Mm -hmm. That was really nice, thank you. The Pier Art Centre mm. must be one of the most beautiful art galleries in the British Isles, yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier, you mentioned Barbara Hepworth, mm. you mentioned Sir Ives. So presumably you made reacquaintance with the Pier yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. And with Sylvia Wishart's enormous painting there. Mm. It's just on Fabriano paper. Reworked yes. and reworked and reworked. Yeah. You know? Well, Fabriano paper, yeah, what's yeah. that? Well, it's a, it's a thick watercolour paper that she must have got in a great big roll because it's, it's huge, it's vast, this painting. Mm. And she's worked that surface almost like the, the stones are worked. It's, it's scraped into, it's rubbed off, it's... Mm. The pastel builds up, you know, like a kind of powder on it. Mm. 
There's something, uh, and I'm improvising in a, in a sense, but listening to you talk about Edwin Muir and the whole idea, which for him, Orkney was a kind of a lost Eden, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah that's he'd, right. He'd moved as a child away, brought up as a child yeah. on Orkney and then moved to Glasgow, which he found horrific. Yeah. And so mm. Orkney was always this nostalgic place. Yeah. And there's a sense when we look at these and we sense of all the things that are going on in the world now, there's a sense of connecting mm. to something ancient, something mm. timeless, something mm. elemental. Mm. Was there an element of escapism for you in, in this? I don't know if it's escapism. I was thinking about this earlier because I think, although I'm not going to jump up and down with a placard saying, just stop oil, I agree absolutely with what they're doing and in a, in a way I think that quietly observing how profound the land and the light mm. on the land can be we're helping to add to that argument mm. so I don't think escapism I think it's almost the opposite it's almost getting back to the kernel of what we need to be thinking about mm. in conservation terms apart from anything else very nicely put very nicely put okay so before we um invite some comments and questions from the audience. Just a, a, a few more questions. The obvious one, uh, where does this now take you? Is this, uh, what, comes out, what comes out of this next? Is it, do you see more work emerging from this? Are you going to go back to Orkney? What's the... Going back, uh -huh. um, it's actually been very, very difficult re slotting into my normal kind of studio routine i've been sort of faffing about a bit not knowing quite <laughs> what am i doing and i think in a way what i'm going to have to do is perhaps well one of the good things that's happened is that these little tiny um nighttime paintings they're little oil paintings on that pumice powder um and they are i did a series of slightly bigger oil paintings from them, which was using almost that kind of pointillist thing I was telling you about, mm. and took them down to the dovecote, and they're now making enormous big rugs of these images, and that kind of pointillist way of putting on the colour works really, really well mm. for gun tufting. Mm. So there's going to be that lovely transition of a tiny element that I was trying to capture, how do Fantastic. I do it, suddenly becoming as big, almost, well, as big, sort of, as when you're looking at the night sky, you know, Fantastic. you have that vastness to it. Yeah. So that's a lovely thing okay. to develop. Also on Orkney, there's a paper makers there, internationally well-known, fantastic paper makers. I'd love to do a series of prints in the print studio in Orkney on the, on mm. the paper made in Orkney. But that's all kind of future stuff. And meanwhile, yeah. I've got a couple of shows to do. So I don't know. Watch this space. <laughs> Watch this space, indeed. So, Nick, what do you think? It's probably time we can open it up to... Yeah? yeah? All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, questions, comments for Vicky? Who would like to go first? At the back, gentlemen, at the back. The two solstices. Two solstices. Yes. Well, yes, I mean, th there is a sort of mystical thing associated with the solstice where the rays of the sun will enter the building at Maze Howe and illuminate a wall. Um, and, in, and in the night, in, sorry, in the winter solstice, there's a, obviously a different kind of celebration that everybody is holding together as a community. Um, and of course, those two opposing things are very, you know, they are the contrast, aren't they, between the two, the two realities. You did, a, you did a painting, or I seem to remember a painting, was it about 10 years ago, called The Shortest Day? Yes. Mm, that's right, that's the same thing. And you've done The Longest Day. Yes, that's right. There you are. That's a banal observation for you. <laughs> uh, Sorry? Were you there at the longest day? 
yeah, I missed it by one day. There were, the plane was delayed. But I was there on the 22nd, 23rd of June. Yeah, it's just, yes. And the weird thing was that when I went, the sun set always behind Brodka in the summer, but in the winter, it moved along, and it set, and I always thought west was west, <laughs> but of course, it, it goes to the, it was going to the northwest, it was extraordinary, and that, that did thro throw me, that was quite, <laughs> quite weird. Other questions? Go on. How did you get on in Yesenki? I went there and it was so windy. Yeah. It was so hard yes. to keep warm, never mind draw. Yeah. No. I mean, you're right. I tried. Yeah. <laughs> Boots and I borrowed a really good jacket from my son-in-law and then a waterproof over the top of it so any of the photographs of me out drawing I'll come on. <laughs> like that that is the only thing i could do yes, yes it yeah is yeah hard, yeah it's like that great comment by Duga when he's looking at paintings by monet you know that? he says uh, every time i see a painting by monet i want to put my collar up <laughs> yes <laughs> oh. <clears throat> yes Nabi, the, the layering of the, the rock is, I mean, that looks amazing. You seem to be yeah. fascinated by the striations yes. and... Yes, yes, and that was the f one of where I was drawing from, there were these bubbles coming, floating up in the air, and I thought for a long time there was a child with a, you know, somewhere with a bubble thing, but it was the spume bubbles from the sea, about, you know, 30 metres higher, floating in the air. And that's what that poem of, again, it's George Mackay Brown, he's talking about the spume bubbles, and they're like jewels. Mm. Hmm. Anyone else? At, at the back, lady at the back, thank you. Did you have any opportunity to go out in a boat? No. <laughs> Not with those seas, no. <laughs> Uh, somebody, a friend of mine who's been talking, he said the little flight over to Westray and Papa Westray is wonderful. I, that, that's perhaps what I'll try and do when I go back. Yeah. You weren't seeking out extremes of weather, were you? You, no. weren't, you weren't doing a Joan Eardley. No. You, 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 no. The weather came to, came to you. <laughs> came you didn't. To me. You, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd be interested sorry. in Carrie. Um, um, well, I mean, it's a lot of it is sketchbook and small scale, you know, and the, the, the big ones, I didn't lay them down until I got back to Edinburgh so they could be rolled. Um, yeah, I just kind of tend to work fairly small scale, I think, really. But your different things that you used. Oh, yeah, just sort of, just yeah. Big, big rucksack. You see, there's a sympathetic image of you hobbling around with your sore oh, leg with all, this, uh, all, these, all these materials. I know, I know, uh, I know. Yeah. That was actually one of the first questions I had, which I just stroked out. I said, how far did you roam? <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> clearly not very. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. no. Um, at the back. Could you say something about your first picture? It's quite well Could you say something about your first picture? Oh, I mean, they were atrocious. They, they were horizontal rain. So, I mean, we got quite a lot of that as well at, um, at Bursay. But uh, that's, that's part of it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And presumably this was a, a deliberate juxtaposition that you went in the summer and yeah. then again in the winter. And that was, yeah. that was, that was pre-planned. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. The first of these two trips, did you know in advance that you were going to be using lots of different media, or had you just made that possible in case that's what you Did I know in advance that I was going to be using this sort of media? Well, lots of different media. Lots of different media. Yeah, um, I tend, if I'm, if I'm going away drawing, I tend to prepare lots of different papers um, just so that I can respond differently. Um, and I thought that probably oil would be a bit difficult because uh, on a canvas, you ha well, I have to seem to layer it and layer it and layer it till I get the kind of um, surface I want, whereas on paper, I can achieve that more quickly. Yeah. 
And I think using primed paper or very absorbent or very thin paper or paper with kind of knobbly textures in, it, it all sort of helps to, uh, to establish a beginning anyway. Yeah. Okay. Leslie. Is this exhibition going to the Pier Art Centre? <laughs> There's going to be a exhibition at the Pier Art Centre. I'm very much hoping that I can keep quite a bit of this intact um, to show up there. I think that's going to be either 24 or 25. Yeah. So that would be, that would be the most fantastic thing to be showing up there yeah. with um, next to their collection. Yeah. yeah. What we didn't really explain uh, was that uh, obviously the Peer Art Centre in Stromness mm. You were in Bursay in this new uh, facility that mm. they've set yes, up, the uh, Link, Lynx, Lynx House, House. Lynx House which, is, um, which was the family had intended it for uh, artistic purposes, yes. uh, but then uh, when then. The, that foundation was wound up, yeah. it, rever it reverted to the Peer Art Centre. And they, That's right. they did extraordinarily well to raise a whole lot of money to, yeah. uh, to convert it. And I always thought Lynx House was a sort of play, that it was a link with, with Pier. But it's not, it's because it's on what used to be the Lynx, the golf Lynx. <laughs> Very good. Is, is there a place, per se, is that a place? Is there a village? Uh, yes, but it's called Palace. Right, okay. So well, you, you, you've, you've given us a, um, a motive for going to Orkney in either 24 or 25, haven't yeah. you? Okay. Yeah. Um, is there anyone else? Yes, but I quite like that. I think that's quite a sort of focusing thing, you know. Yeah. How long was it? It was, I was there, what, um, a month in the summer and about 10 days in the winter. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, it would take me three weeks to get my brushes out, I think. <laughs> um, Good. Okay. It's on Dev Toss. Did you visit Shetland? <laughs> no, I haven't yet visited Shetland. No. 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 Another treat. Quite mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Vicky, is there anything that we should have asked you? I don't think so, John. I think that was that was good. I, I quite enjoyed that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, well look, uh, congratulations again on uh, the residency. Uh, I think it's a real privilege to be able to uh, to see this work and to see, you know, I think, to be honest, I think it's astonishing what you achieved in uh, that, that sh such, such a short time. And uh, you did range widely, you did experiment widely, yet you can see a consistency and, uh, and a focus coming through. Mm. So, you know, congratulations and thank you so much for letting us uh, mm. see it. Thank and you. Th th thank you very much. Was there another question? Sorry, was that what you were pointing? No, no. Mm. Thank you so much for talking about it and being so uh, so open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.